Welcome to Luxoft Tech Talks, a series of podcasts in which IT gurus share their knowledge and discuss the latest trends and innovations in the world of IT. We are going to cover the most recent developments in the programming languages, frameworks, and technologies that are shaping the future of the software industry. This new format of online learning is part of Luxoft Learning Management and Development Services rebranding. Please share your feedback in the comments to let us know what speakers and topics you would like us to cover in later installments. Hello guys and welcome on today's talk. I'm Evgeny Kostadinov and I'm gonna present to you a presentation about the design patterns and concepts in test automation. This is a very important and huge topic. We are going to touch the basics and we're going to move slowly and gradually into more advanced stuff. So let's start with what are we going to cover in the series? So the first is starting with design patterns and concepts in test automation. Then we are going to take a deep dive and move to more advanced patterns for web test automation and mobile, because most of the things that we can use for web are also applicable for the mobile automation. Advanced design patterns, we are going to turn to desktop API and data warehouses. So just for a quick example, we have a lot of considerations when we move to mobile testing. There's limitations, for example, how we can run tests in parallel. Also, since a page object model is really popular, there's a lot of solutions in the internet that suggest that this is the only way. But you're going to take a look and closer investigate how we can improve and actually take a step further our solution without using this silver bullet. We're going to cover patterns like object map, screenplay, mission pattern, and loadable component. They all move gradually and solving different problems, but they build on top of the previous one, and this will help us understand how to actually solve the problem at hand. In many cases, we don't really need the complete set of the pattern. Sometimes we can only use parts or portions of the solution without over-engineering and put a, putting an extra economical burden on our solution. We're going to talk about also about good, we're going to talk also about good practices, like how we can invoke our code, how our tests are becoming and should be hermetic, and also how we can use a backdoor manipulations in order to make them more stable. Web tests and mobile, which are touching the user interface, are tending to be flaky. So there's a lot of issues that we can avoid if we know and construct well our code. Talking about desktop automation, there are also a lot of challenges like keeping session alive and using it on a CI server. We're going to talk about this in detail. API testing is something that we're going to cover after that because there's a lot of challenges when we move and actually want a fully scalable and a good solution that needs to work on a CI server again. So we need to build our own domain specific language and a dedicated layer that is going to contain our domain specific logic and model. We're going to talk about different patterns that will help us organize, structure our code and also make it more extendable. When we talk about data warehouse automation, we're going to cover, about, cover enterprise patterns, which are mostly put there to help us with managing the big data that those solutions actually govern. So we're going to take a look on the fixtures and how structure our code with better test automation design patterns that are specifically tailored to solve our problems when we automate data warehouses. Test automation patterns. When we talk about design, we need to be aware that this is just one of the many other patterns. For example, there are process patterns because there's an entire ecosystem and the design of our code and tests is really just a small portion. We need to be able as a good QA engineers to understand how are those related to the entire process. So process patterns will help us to learn how to set up or improve the test automation process regarding of do we start from zero ground or we need to improve and evolve our solution because software constantly evolves, evolves and we need to be catching up with our 
complexity. Next, we can, we can talk about management patterns, which are aiming to help us with managing the test automation and the entire development process, because test automation is really development effort and it follows really the same software development life cycle, good practices. Some of the design patterns are really taken or reused in order to, to make the test code and the test wear better, but those are not specifically tied to test automation. They are just adopted in the context of test automation. And again, design patterns are the next step. So once we have the process set, all the management and the workflows there for us, we can go and design our test code. So this design will help us to make our solution more efficient, easy and maintainable. It's, it's really important to understand that maintenance costs can go high up as to like 90% of the time we can dedicate to fixing tests due to poor design or architecture of our framework. So it's really important here to understand how to make our code better. Execution patterns are the last part that we are going to take a deep dive. It's really important our patterns to work not only on our machines because their real value is and when they are exercised on a CI server or they are part, an integral part of continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. But we are going to talk this later today. So execution patterns cover the part of taking care of our execution and how to make it easy and reliable. Today, we are going to focus on test harness architecture. We are going to talk about intentional architecture and incremental design. We're going to take a deep dive and look how we can improve our architecture or start a new project and pick up the common modules, common languages, or our components and how to architect those and solve the big picture problems. Solve the big picture problems. Design patterns and concepts in test automation. We are going to cover a couple of design patterns and concepts that are applicable to test automation adopted from the development. X unit patterns is entire family and actually a philosophy that we are going to take a look today. It's very important to understand first the principles and then move to the, the, to the details and the implementation of the patterns because X unit really is more of a mindset. Then we're going to complete the talk today with continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines, some patterns, good practices, and how to plug our solutions into already existing continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline. Let's take a look at the test harness architecture and how we are going to introduce and incorporate our design and make it live and actually comply our, in our architectural view. So the test harness is the other well-known name of our test framework. We are going to use a lot, this term a lot. So it, it literally means the same. Test harness, it's not just our test code or just our tests or the data that we are using for them. It's actually the entire collection of all the software pieces that we are going to use. Keep in mind that this also involves piece of code that automatically generate dynamic data or read static data from files or a database. This also applies to the configuration because most of the solutions will have to work on different environments. For a quick example, part of our framework can exercise user acceptance tests on higher environment and exercise integration tests on lower environment. We can, if built well, our test framework will be able to reuse the big portion of both tests and keep those in one place. So how we can achieve this is really splitting our test harness into three main parts. The first one is the so-called engine. The other name that you see in those solution is a core features. For a quick example here, this could be a file parser that is going to feed our tests with static data or configurations for those. Let's say we want to, work, to run one and the same tests on different environments. We're going to change only the configuration and nothing more. 
the engine should take part and configure both executions with the same tests just by setting different environment. Test scripts or our business domain model is another big part or actually a dedicated responsibility area of our framework. Both engine and scripts should have no knowledge about each other. Just a quick example, engine should really care which tests is going to exercise and use its features. And on the other side, scripts should not really care which engine exercises the system under tests. If built well, our test automation framework, our harness, we're going to be able to dynamically decide which engine is actually need based on the configuration. So scripts can be all and the same. All we need to do is just to point to a different adapter or a different driver in order to do the job for us. The last part is dedicated to the test data. It's really important to understand again here that if we don't change the engine and the scripts, we still may have a different configuration and combination of tests due to the data that we feed into our execution. So data put simply can be split into static data that we never change, but we need to really move and make an extra management layer who is going to take care for this for us. For example, parse Excel or feed the data from a database that we have pre-configured. Dynamic data is generated on the fly. It's always unique. Here we have to again think about how our, our engine is going to take care of logging all this data because we'll need these execution details if we want to troubleshoot. Also, how we're going to generate the data to be valid. For example, if we have a very complex business domain model that relies on very complex entities, we need to take care of this in our engine. Test code is production code, and it's really important to switch our mind and treat with the same respect our test code as a production code, meaning that all the good practices, all the life cycle phases that the production code is going should happen for the test solutions as well. For example, we can have unit tests of our engine. Those are not tests of the test itself, but really test the logic and the design of our core features. Same concepts, principles, and care should be applied there. So for example, if we have a Git branching model, we have to put those not only for the production code, but for the test code as well. Meaning that if we have a dedicated feature for the tests, it should pass a code review. Workflow and good practices like Git branching or whatever the case might be, should be applied and strictly followed. For example, if we have a naming convention for our production code, we can reuse or adapt the same for our testing solution. Maintenance and low complexity are most critical because like I said, the maintenance costs can go very high up and reach like 90% of the time. So we are going to spend six or seven hours a day fixing tests and fixing problems that come due to poor design. Let's go and take a deep dive into how we can architect such a framework. If we're going to talk about architecture, we need to be aware that it's really about an abstraction. The abstraction of the system that we're going to build. We're not going to answer specific implementation questions. We're going to answer questions about what and not about how. How is answers that we're going to get when we move with the design. But first we need to be aware, for example, what types of generators we're going to use. Are we going to parse static files or are we going to generate test data on the fly? How we're going to handle our reporting? Do we need, for example, third party modules that we're going to enhance our reporting? Many frameworks support just JSON formats. And if you want to make it a bit more business presentable, you need to add an additional dependency that can transform your JSON format or XML format into an HTML. So third party dependencies, languages, high level responsibilities of our modules should be answered at this stage. 
it's important to understand here that architecture is not something static. It doesn't happen just once. It should evolve and refactoring, refactoring should be a constant part of our daily work. Once we have our architecture outlined, we can go and choose the specific frameworks, languages, scope, what are the goals that we're going to solve here, and the third party dependencies and integrations. It's essential to understand that those can be is, should be easily swappable, meaning that if tomorrow we don't need a dedicated framework, we can move to another one with ease. Let's take a look at the generations of different automation frameworks and how they build on top of each other. It's really important again to understand that sometimes we don't need a full blown solution. Even most simple stuff can do its job well and it's greatest benefit is, it, is that it's simple, meaning that it's maintainable and it's easy extendable. We don't over design, we, go, we don't go overboard with our solution just because we can. So the most simple, the first generation really, automation framework can be built on record and playback tools. Those are having not so good, so good name in our community, but again, depending on the context, those could be our right cho choice. For example, our test automation team is not very good technically and cannot really create automated tests without coding skills. So what we can do here is to really adopt and have our own solution around a record and playback tool. There's a lot of examples out there, but when we're talking about web automation, there are at least five different kinds of tools and successors of Selenium IDE which means that we can choose the best one that fits our needs. Some of them, for example, require basic JavaScript coding skills, others don't. It's very important here to note that the recorded tests should not be fixed. Those are and should be disposable, meaning that when we have a failure, we should not invest too much time into fixing either the flow or the data or the execution of these tests of those tests. We can just go find what's the issue and record the test. Then we can move to the next one onto, or to a better suited job for us. For example, we can go and export test our feature, export or test our feature and let all the boring stuff to be handled by the record and playback tool. Next generation that builds on top of what's already been there it's called modular and data-driven frameworks. Though really have, those are relying really heavily on different modules that are exported as scripts and later those are combined into more complex tests. Meaning that at this point, we already have some reusability and we are avoiding the code duplication in our tests. Data-driven frameworks add a very specific layer data providers that help us with all the test data that we need. In most cases, those are really just a file parsers that help us to get the data either from a predefined set or from a database. Like I said, data layer is added on top of all the other types. It's not specific only for this data-driven framework generation, but also is used or reused or enhanced later with the latest generations of the test frameworks. But the idea here is to really, to segregate the different responsibilities. Tests are having only knowledge about the execution flow and the different steps that they need to be executed, but the data layer should provide all the needed test data. The next generation that builds on top of the before mentioned uh, frameworks are so-called library frameworks. Those really provide a bit better design when it comes to modularity. So they segregate the application into common functions. Then again, get and combine those so we can have a common steps, reuse our code, and we avoid duplication of our logic. Then we group the functions and make it more complex depending on our test case scenarios. In many cases, this means that 80, 90% of the test is the same. We can take a quick example. We can submit a form or cancel a form. Until we hit the button, it's pretty much the same test. 
if we have, for example, valid submit form and we have cancel valid form, the only difference is going to be in the different button or the different action that is going to be triggered. Keyword driven frameworks are really putting the business involvement into the lights. So we now have the ability to involve business people that don't really understand the technology or shouldn't really understand the technology behind our testing solutions. But keyword driven frameworks are pretty much mapping between a specific keys and specific functions that's going to be executed. The greatest benefit in keyword driven frameworks is that we can ask for a review from a business person or a domain expert in that matter that can go and help us with the design of our test cases, meaning that we are going to avoid unrealistic scenarios or something that bring us no value when it comes to automation. So keywords are having specific syntax. Once we teach this to, to the, our uh, reviewers and peers, it's very easy for them to contribute actually to, to the testing framework by creating the tests for us. Here, it's important to underline that the test data, again, and scripts are logically separated. Like we said in the beginning, we have data, engine, and tests having no knowledge about each other. One of the last and the latest types and generations of automation frameworks are so-called so -called BDD or Behavior Driven Development Frameworks. They reuse and enhance everything before them, but making it and taking a bit step further when it comes to business involvement. Now we don't have just keywords that's sometimes hard to understand, but we now have a plain English syntax. It's called Gherkin. That is helpful when we ask for a view from or involvement from our stakeholders. The BDD markup is integrated very well with most of IDEs meaning that we can actually have an autocomplete and we can have uh, references from our Gherkin steps to the actual functions. Hybrid testing frameworks is really nothing more but a combination of one or multiple frameworks to this point, meaning that we can either make it worse or make it a lot better because every solution so far has both pros and cons. If we're going to combine the different stuff, we need to be aware what are the pros and what are really the positives that we are going to get when we combine such solutions. We should not blindly follow the design that we find in some other guy's solution or repo because there's con their context is really different from, our, from ours. So we, we either leverage the benefits of all kinds of the solutions we have seen so far or we either make it worse for us by blindly adopting something that it may not be well suited for our case. The really last one generation of test automation harness that we're going to talk today, it's so-called AI powered, meaning that artificial intelligence should be involved at least in some parts of our solution. At this point, there are no really a solid proof that it, this is happening anywhere. There's a lot of claims and from a lot of companies that this has been achieved, but there's no real solution and no real proof that this is actually happen, is happening. For example, the AI can fix your tests. It should know how to fix your workflow or how to make a step back and adjust to the, for example, UI changes that have been introduced, it should automatically detect what are the changes and decide by itself which is the proper action to take. It should require no human in the loop intervention in order to fix a test and actually submit this to our repository. Again, the future of testing is yet to be achieved and there's a lot of big promises that we are going to see hopefully happening in the next couple of years. This concludes our first part and we're going to move from architecture to design patterns and concepts that have been tailored into test automation. Let's take and start with design principles, concepts and paradigms 
because these those are actually the foundation that all the patterns are built on top of. Meaning that if we know the different foundation concepts, it's easy to understand and adopt the pattern and not blindly follow just because this is a solution that works in 99% of the cases. So what is the principle? In most basic explanation, this is just a concept. It's a type of concept, an idea about something. Meaning that it represents a relationship or a rule that we can follow. If you go and try to search what's really a design pattern, in most cases you're going to find that this is a solution for a commonly and general occurring problem, meaning that you can take it and use it and it's most likely gonna work. But again, we need to consider what are the rules and what are the relationships that are inside in this pattern and are they applicable to our context. We can use design principles to provide a higher level and mature our solution. If we don't have design patterns or we have them poorly implemented due to poor understanding, or poor implementation, whatever the case might be, this is going to make our solution much, much worse. Sometimes if you can just go with the simplest design possible and allow the design patterns to actually evolve and emerge from our solution. Design patterns are language agnostic, meaning that in most cases you can do it in pretty much any language. The implementation details are really left for the programming language but you need to understand how this design pattern actually solves the problem. For example, in common design pattern, we delegate part of the functionality to different objects. But if we don't have objects, we can go with another pattern that is called servant. Depending on the language, there's really a, a slight difference between the both. But this is more of exception to the rule. Solid principles are fundamental for software development. Combining the design principles and solid principles, we're going to see a lot of patterns that make a very good use, at least a couple of those. So let's take a quick look what's so-called solid principles. It's an acronym that combines different principles that have been proven in millions of projects. So let's start with single responsibility. We should have only one valid reason for our object or function to exist or change, which means that if our design is good, we can only extend our software. Open cost principle is really simple, but it's, it's simple in explaining, but really hard to achieve because a lot of the times we tend to over-engineer our solutions. So in most simple words, this means that our software should be extendable without changing the content. If we need to add or enrich our functionality, we should be able to only append stuff. We should not need to go and change the different classes or the different functions in order to accommodate to the needed changes. Lisco, Lisco substitution principle is a very specific case of inheritance, meaning that every subclass should be sub substitutable for their parent. This aims to help us with our inheritance and the complex taxonomy that we are going to see in a lot of projects. Interface segregation states that we should not, we should break down all the interfaces and not have very heavy and very complex interfaces in order to solve our problem because interfaces are really an abstraction and the simple it is the better because it's much, much better to combine different interfaces and have those in different combination instead of having one very ugly and, and very complex interface that, that we need to implement in our solution. So we don't impose any restrictions or we don't impose any needless logic on our clients. Dependency inversion is our last principle. It can be boiled down to depend on abstraction and not on implementation details. What does this really mean? That abstraction should not really care about how it's going to be implemented and the interface should only provide the contract that the clients are going to implement. Of course, there are other principles, but we are going to cover only the most important ones. 
Don't repeat yourself is about code repetition and the duplication of logic. It states that we should have only one place at which we have our logic. This means that we should use data to, no to normalize and avoid redundancy. You aren't gonna need it, advisors to actually avoid over design and over complicated stuff and to make really assumptions about how something should work. We're going to build only the minimum viable stuff and then gradually evolve it and, and make it applicable to its current context, future context. So we only add functionality when it's deemed necessary. We don't put reporting un unless and until we need it. Keep it simple, stupid, it's actually an army principle. It said that most simple systems work best because they're, well, simple. If we make them complicated, they have all the different relationships or they have different responsibilities, which might not be really needed. Let's put all together and show an example of those principles. Let's assume that this solution here with different forms needs to be built. This is how we see it in the beginning and we tend to have a different solution for everything and for every component in our system. But if we go and apply your go and gonna need it principle, we'll see that we can only go with just a fraction of the functionality, actually the core functionality that we need. Then we can apply the keep it simple principle, which means that again, we can make or adjust most of the functionality and to, to take, to make it better by taking care of the common functionality stuff. As you can see, the forms are now becoming either a triangle or a square. And then we can move into the last principle and really dry our code by combining and avoiding duplication of logic in our tests. we can move into X-Unit design patterns. After we have seen so far, what is the architecture, how we can apply it, what are the basic principles that we need to be aware when we use patterns, how those really help us into providing and getting to a more mature, more extendable and well-designed solution. X-Unit is really a family of different frameworks. So many of those patterns we are going to see today are going to be either part of your framework or future one. We need to understand for historical reasons how we ended up with XUnit. So XUnit tools, it's, it's really about the philosophy and thinking how we can incorporate better design into our tests. Years ago, testing solutions tend to be without any design, any architecture, made up just for solving the problem and that's all, but they never evolved. They never structured, they never moved to a better design. So with time, this means that our solution gets less and less capable of solving the problem. Here with XUnit, we are provided with opportunity to really have powerful regression test suites that really decrease our effort that help us with low maintenance and solve other problems. We can always go and rethink the design. Again, this is a process and X unit can be applied on different stages of the life cycle of your project or it can be used for refactoring because there are different patterns again when we go and talk about refactoring. It plays really nice with the test driven development which means that you should start first with the tests and then move with implementation. Again, it's not uncommon to see unit tests of your core functionality of the framework. There are really more than 60 patterns and today we are going to stop and discuss only the most important ones. Keep in mind, there's different solutions here and those are evolving different and more modern frameworks like Mocha, for example, are co contributing to those. So you can go and always check these patterns before you jump into any solution. 
with X unit patterns, the test the tests are really first class citizens because we now have and adopt most of the patterns or the solutions from the actual development. This improves our framework structure, which allows us for cleaner, smaller, and yet powerful extensions, which supports the open cost principle we have already seen. A golden ha hammer is a principle that says that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, meaning in our context, that if you know just three design patterns, you're most likely gonna bend your solution to make it work with the patterns. And this is not the idea of all the solutions that we have discussed so far. If we're going to talk about programming, people usually tend to go through at least a couple of different stages, but they start as junior people and they pretty much have no idea about design patterns. They just solve the problem at hand and forget about it. There's no structure, there's no design, no thinking about how this solution have dependencies or, use de or uses dependencies to other and from other components. Then with time, we start to learn about design patterns and start to force everything into design patterns because it's so easy. I have a problem, I find the best and the most close pattern and I just use it. But again, patterns are not meant to solve every problem in every context. In all reality, you just need most likely just a part of the design pattern. And the final stage is that people with more experience don't blindly follow patterns. They allow the patterns to emerge from the solution and to gradually evolve it with time. It's very important to understand that we have intentional architecture and emergent design. Those are the two forces of one and the same effort that we are going to do over and over again in our work with the testing solution. Of course, we need to have some design upfront, but those should be, but though this design upfront, this architecture should not be all and 99% set in stone, meaning that we should allow in time for emerging design and we should always accommodate to change because software is always e evolving. Design for testing. There's no point of having a good, well-designed, beautiful testing solution if we don't have a way to apply it. In many systems, testability is really the last concern, but these have a, a very high price to pay because testability means usability. We in all essentials are really building a client for the system under test, which means that if you want to have a testable features, you need to invest in testability. There's a different techniques, but we're going to talk about just the most important ones. Historically, this started with hardware. In order to test your hardware, you need to provide some ports or you need to provide some devices that allow for a custom a customer or a client program to go and check what's inside your hardware. Does it really function as it's supposed to be? So people tend to start adding features and make it easier to develop and apply testing to such hardware. Later, with the evolution of software, we also have such techniques. Let's start with the first and the most important one. It's called dependency injection. If we have a dependency injection implemented in our system under test, it's easy to go and swap the client that provides all, all the dependencies for the system under test. What does this mean? Is that if we have a dependency injection, we are going to have an abstraction that allows us to pass the tests or the test to invoke our system under test without the system understand, under test really understanding who is the actual client. Is it a real user or the tests that are being invoking? its functions. So if we have a standard setup method, it's going to create, for example, a test double. This test double later on is going to be used and passed to the system under test without the later on understanding that it's been communicating with not the real dependency. As we can see on the next phase on the actual execution of the tests, once we have this test double, it's really easy via dependency injection to pass the dependent component to the system under test and 
actually the later one using the test double. Another pattern, another solution here is to have a dependency lookup. Dependency lookup is a bit more complex and in most cases it evolve, involves some registry that allows the system under test to ask another object to return the dependency before it uses it. So if we have to look again at our example, we can go and see that in our setup method, we have to configure such a test double, meaning that we provide all the dependencies as test objects. Then if we move to exercise phase, we're going to see that the system under test finds or creates via the registry, the test double. And after that, the next phase is, is to actually use the test double and not the actual dependency. But yet again, this is a bit more complex solution and involves a, a better design here if you're going to use it. Humble object is an attempt to extract all the logic into a separate, easy to test component that is decoupled from its environment. Let's take a look at this example. Environment is something that runs, for example, in multi-threaded setup and relies on a lot of complex processes and this is not always easy to test. The idea here is to have all the logic that's possible to test by itself, regardless of the environment, to be put in a such a humble object. So once we either set up exercise or verify our testing testable component, it always go and refers to the humble object. The last one is called test hook but you can see it in the practice as feature toggles. So the basic idea here is really simple, but yet and again comes with a price to pay. We need to make our code system under test and its dependencies aware that we are actually performing testing. Meaning that, for example, if we have like here an execution of our tests, the system under test should be aware if this is a testing request or not. Most cases that I have seen this work in my experience are related, for example, to Google reCAPTCHA. As by design, reCAPTCHA is meant to really uh, avoid and block, actually prohibit automation. It's really hard to have this feature disabled or bypassed. So if we don't have this built in into our solution, we are going to have a lot of troubles or we're going to miss this in our automation tests. So basically, when the system under test is being invoked, invoked, it goes and makes a check if this is really a production logic or it's test specific logic. If we have a basic configuration, for example, on the test environment, we can always say that all the tests should invoke the test specific logic, meaning that we can have configuration file for our war environments and different configuration file for our production and staging environments. Yet again, it has a complicated usage because not only the system under test needs to be aware of the test specific logic, but also the dependency. For example, if we need to test a workflow with a banking system or a third party provider of payments, it also needs to provide such a logic or a test account in order to use it. Let's move to the fixture setup patterns. Tests don't start at any point in time, they have either state or data to be pre-configured before we actually go and exercise the specific function. The most basic fixture pattern is called delegated setup, which means that we move all the fresh fixtures to, a specific, to specific utility methods and each test is responsible by its own to invoke such utility methods before it moves to actual execution of the function. In this case, this means that we can have a newly registered user from, for, each tests, for each test from the suit, meaning that test one, test two, and test n will have different and unique users. Suit fixture setup is built and is building and destroying a shared fixture in a special method called by, called by the test automation framework before and after our tests are really executed, meaning that we can move shared state to either 
our setup or our teardown. For a quick example, if we want for a test suite to have a dedicated data available, and this is immutable, it can be shared through the entire tests in the suite, you can always avoid and dry your code, putting all the setup logic into the setup method. If we need to, of course, tear down and destroy all the shared state or data, we can go and put all the logic of all the tests into the tear down. Quick example here could be to keep a record of all the transactions made and on the tear down method, you can go and roll back all the transaction during the execution of this test suite. Pre-built fixture is something that we can see very often implemented on continuous integration servers, meaning that we have shared fixture separated from the running tests. This is a responsibility not of the test runner or the test itself, or even the harness itself, it's a responsibility given to a continuous integration server easily. And sometimes this is achieved just by a pre-built step which, for example, provide us download files for our users and data or putting this user and data into a database that we are going to use in our tests. Inline setup means that each test method creates its own fresh fixture by calling an appropriate constructor to build exactly the test fixture that it requires. Each test is responsible for its own inline setup this is in most cases due to some unique users or state that needs to be tested in our tests. Let's move to the teardown patterns. Automated teardown is really simple and in most cases we don't need to really take any special care about it. But in order to make the best out of it, you need to be aware how it really works. So we keep a, a track of records of all the resources that are created in our tests and we delegate this automate, automatic destruction or freeing the resources in the teardown method. So let's take a quick example here. Test methods are really just recording what their resources and they can put this into our test object registry. Once they're complete, all the execution of the test cases in the suite, we can go and in the teardown invoke collect all the test related resources and then in a single transaction, tear them down. Inline tear down is a variation of the inline setup. So each method should be responsible for destroying its own resources, meaning that all the tests tear down at the end, what resources they have been either set up or acquired during the tests. Garbage collected teardown is specific to a garbage collection featured languages, meaning that if we don't have a garbage collection language on our hand, we need to explicitly take care of this. But in most cases, for example, we have created different objects during our test methods. We don't explicitly destroy them. This is all being taken care of by the garbage collection functionality feature in our programming language. Implicit teardown. All what our test automation framework is doing is really go and collect all the logic put into the teardown method after each test case is executed. So we can have it on a different levels. One is on the test case level. On another, like this example here, the implicit teardown is on the level of each test. This concludes our X unit overview and we will move down to continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines. Before we go, I would really like would really like to make a stop here and emphasize that all the functionality of the efforts so far are having very, very little value if they are not put and they are not integral part of a continuous integration build or they're not part of continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline, because this is where the true colors and the true benefit of automation really comes. Continuous integration is really 
more, more, much more than our CI server. When I go and ask people, do you have continuous integration working in your team? They start talking about different servers like Jenkins, Bamboo, Team City, without really understanding that the continuous integration is really a methodology and a set of practices that aim to isolate changes which are merged into a main line at least once a day. It's really important to stress here that once a day is the minimum. It's originally started without this advice, but with the extreme programming coming later on, this is the practice that's the minimum standard. If you don't have something to commit once a day, you can't have really continuous integration. So the real goal and the real benefit of continuous integration is to provide a rapid feedback about all the changes that we have been introduced during the day. Some companies are actually having multiple tens of merges into the main line a day, which means that they have all this benefit of having early on detection on what is the, what's the issues that have been found, if any, or how we can really go and fix them with the shortest amount of time possible or the lowest cost possible. Because the earlier we find the issue, it's more cheaper and more easier to fix it without going and getting all the different days of code changes that are coming into the main line from the different developers. Let's stop for a minute and again, iterate on what have been said so far. Continuous integration is really again, a methodology set of practices that help us to avoid defects down the road. This is a practice that needs to be incorporated and used by the entire development team because it really catches all the defects, smaller ones make less complex and easier to resolve those defects. We need to always consider how our tests are going to run on a CI pipeline. In most cases, just take a quick example in the UI tests, we don't run them in a headless mode or we don't think about parallel execution. And this really matters when you have to, when you have a CI pipeline and merge all the different, even tens of times a day changes into your, into your main line. Meaning that if you have two hours of tests and you have 10 merges a day, no one is going to wait for our automation tests. We need to find a way and to accommodate our tests to the continuous integration pipeline. Let's take a look on the continuous integration patterns. Again, there's a lot of patterns. It's a huge, huge topic. We're going to touch only on the most critical to understand ones. Software should be built on every change that's merged into master, meaning that if we have a problem, we are going to pretty much make it transparent and visible actually and solved right away. Version control system is now a given, but this is, this is not always the case and wasn't always the case. It's one of the pillars of the CI and this is industry standard practices like Private workspaces, meaning that each developer should work in its own workspace. We should all have a shared repository, a master branch, and of course, a dedicated branching policy. Task level commit integrates enough progress that have been made during the day and allow all the contributions to really merge together. We should all have a label, for example, a milestone, that's usually a release, that mark important phase in our main line. Let's take a quick example with the Git flow model, which states that we should cut a branch, a release branch. This is our milestone from the main line. Build management is important because it relies on CI server hooks and workflows, meaning that we can have a different integrations from version control systems, other systems that are, for example, for reporting, and we need to, to make it aware and manage it well if we want to have this solution working for us. Expedit fixes are something that relies on resolving occasional build issues because in all reality, we are always going to have some build issues, but by pulling from master branch and fixing all the broken builds immediately, we are going to have a stable continuous integration pipeline and a process. Continuous, continuous delivery is the next the next evolutionary step of continuous integration. It builds on top of, of what's already been achieved by the continuous integration. 
pretty much it can be explained as the ability to get all the changes into the production. So we have always a releasable software. We can give the software to our users safely and quickly in a sustainable way. The keyword here is the sustainable way. We should always have a releasable and ready to ship software. This can happen on demand. We don't have an automation or some trigger that can promote this into production without any human intervention. If we're going to have such a rule or an automation around it, then we're talking about continuous deployments. We can have and actually incorporate one of the test patterns. We can have a smoke suit that's executed a really, really small set of tests that are covering only the most critical parts of the system after each build and after each deploy. Let's take a quick look on the difference between continuous integration, delivery, and deployment. As you can see, the continuous integration is really the basis that relies on build and test and promote to a next upper environment, but not production one, our code. For example, if you have a build and all the unit tests are passing, we can deploy this to a QA environment and exercise the acceptance tests. But we stop there. Continuous delivery help us having an additional mechanic that will allow us to deploy our production. Usually this is a business rule or this is a business process that allow our code to be pushed to production. Continuous deployment on the other hand requires no such intervention. Everything that passes the build, test and deploy phase results in a release automatically. Meaning that if we have build passing the unit tests, promoted to QA environment, passing the acceptance tests, this will result in the next release for our users. As a conclusion, I would like to point a couple of things that are really important to understand and remember from today's talk. The better the design, the, the better our solution is. It's going to be scalable, maintainable, and extendable. Intentional architecture it's not one time thing, it's really a process as our test where evolves around our system under test. And need, we need to take care of specific and dedicate specific time for our architecture and emerging design to happen naturally in our solutions. And lastly, automated tests are an integral part of every CI and CD pipeline. We need to make it work there because it's the value, there's the greatest value that our testing really provides. That's all for today. You can contact me either on GitHub or Gmail, or you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm going to post all the, all the slides in my GitHub account, and I'll be happy to see some contributions from you guys. Thank you.